Uh, my name's Alan. I'm Toledo Indoor Garden Commercial Account Specialist here. I help a lot of the bigger grows get all the supplies they need. Uh, a little history about me is I've spent years in greenhouses growing tomatoes for profit, peppers for profit, lettuce for profit, uh, both indoors and outdoors, both organic and hydroponic. I've done recirculating lettuce systems. I've done betel bucket tomato systems. I've put bags of ProMix on the floor and plugged plants right into them with drip stakes and let it go. Um, my education, I, I, I did a two year program at Owens Community College as an urban farm uh, assistant. Uh, it's an urban agriculture program. I worked with Toledo Grows. I worked with the Toledo Botanical Gardens. Um, I helped community gardens grow vegetables um, and provide food for all of, like the low income uh, areas in Toledo. Uh, we catered to over 100 different community gardens and starting all their plants for them and helping them uh, with harvest and, and keeping things cool and, and dispersing it amongst the community. Um, I also am affiliated with The Ohio State University. I did a master urban farmers class with them. I also did an aquaculture program with them. So I learned how to grow fish, uh, mostly for food and for profit. Um, they have uh, research centers south of Columbus, Ohio State does, where they have just a, a main campus of nothing but aquaculture and, and, and they'll, they'll have uh, classes down there. Uh, also Kentucky State University. Both those universities work together uh, with Ohio State and, and uh, I went to an aquaponics program at Kentucky State University before OSU ever even offered an aquaponics program. And then when OSU offered it, I went back and took it too. So I was gonna grow some fish there for a while. Uh, led me to kinda just working in greenhouses throughout the years. I, I found a better spot that wasn't 90 degrees in the heat all day. And I kinda mm -hmm. still got to help people do what I do. Soil science. Soil is a life supporting layer of all material, guys. A lot of us take soil for granted. Soil is a very thin layer uh, around this planet. Um, and soil is the reason we're here, okay? And without soil, plants wouldn't grow. Uh, plants give us what we need to breathe and we give plants what they need when we exhale. It's, it's our cycle that we give to plants. Uh, soil is highly uh, responsible for climate change as well, uh, carbon sequestration, um, and large amounts of soil and organic matter can store carbon uh, and help reduce temperatures on the globe. Uh, we learned a little bit about soil science in the Dust Bowl of the Great Depression when Guys came back from war. We gave them 500 acres of land to go farm. And we were under the impression that the more area you tilled, the more it was gonna rain. Uh, that's kind of the science that we went by back then. Um, it is not true. Uh, those grasslands that we plowed back then um, had native grasses with root systems that went four or five feet into the soil. Uh, they were highly drought tolerant. When we went through and plowed all those areas in the Midwest, the wind came by and just picked it all up and blew it across the nation. Um, so that's part of the reason uh, the Great Depression started back then. Uh, it made food scarce, it made jobs scarce, uh, and it ruined a lot of soil. Where do I gotta click here? Maybe the bottom, bottom left hand. I like that, hit that arrow to the... Oh, that's what I'm talking Maybe. about. No. Nope. Okay. So maybe Cody, can we bring the laptop maybe out here and have one of us drive? Shouldn't he have a remote at this left? <laughs> we went through it. We're, Did you? We're going through it. <laughs> All right, guys. The atmosphere that we live in, the crust underneath the soil, and the soil—they all interact and provide plants and animals the resources they need. Uh, I kind of just went over this without flipping through the next one. Uh, Temperature, oxygen, water, carbon, these are all basic elements of living lives, uh, living bodies and other, other nutrients. Um, I have pictures here of a few different cycles that talk about 
how we re reuse and, and recycle all this stored energy. Um, obviously, we're all familiar with the rain cycle. There's also a nitrogen cycle. Um, there's nitrogen in the atmosphere that we breathe. It's something like 40% or something like that of the air we breathe is nitrogen. Plants can't use that nitrogen, uh, but there's bacteria and there's organic materials that can convert that nitrogen into plant usable nitrogen. <clears throat> there are some plants out there that can take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and use it. Most of those are like uh, waterlogged marshy plants that live in low oxygen environments. Soil is very important. The world's soil base is shrinking, okay, because of expanding urban areas, soil degradation, erosion, uh, wind, all of that. Uh, as the world population continues to expand, we need to learn how to conserve soil, uh, make it a top priority. Uh, we need to learn how to get more with less. I mean, we're kind of forced into it. All right, there's this thing called the soil pyramid. Uh, we know there's a food pyramid. This soil pyramid is kind of a way that scientists classify soil. Um, and soil is made up of three main products, which is sand, silt, and clay. And you'll see that on that pyramid, but you'll see around in between uh, other classifications of soil. Uh, in the middle, what we call loam. Uh, loam is an even mixture of all three of those, sand, silt, and clay. Um, loam is what us growers generally like to grow in. It's something that's going to hold nutrients, it's going to drain easy, it's going to hold oxygen. All right. Uh, there's all this soil surveying. This is all scientific measurements, arable land, soil horizons are the layers in the soil, uh, soil field mapping, classifications, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Soil properties, this picture gives you a good idea of that soil pyramid that I just showed you. This big particle being sand, this particle being silt, and this little tiny, tiny clay particle down there. Uh, so this particle size has a lot to do with uh, pore space, porosity, permeability, drainage, um, airflow. Uh, so when we make up soils, especially when we're growing, we we work with the parent material that we have, obviously, what's in the land, what's in the fields. Uh, we can't change it too much, uh, so we have to be aware. And, and this all matters of, of how we apply nutrients, um, how we apply water and irrigation. Obviously, if I'm planting things a lot sandier, I will be watering and fertilizing more. If I have clay soils, I'm gonna struggle for them to dry out and get oxygen. The particles are much, much smaller. You can see here in pore space clay soil versus sandy soil. Um, this is compacted soil versus uncompacted soil. So we, we talk about being out in your field, uh, tractors running the same rows all the time, eventually start to compact the soil. It affects root growth, it affects plant growth, it affects the overall soil health in general, uh, which is also called the tilt. This is that same soil triangle. Uh, remember I talked about us as growers. Uh, we generally choose mediums to be ideal to hold water, but not too long. Uh, not sticky like clay, but not hard to work with. Um, medium soils have good traits of both coarse and fine soils. So you're talking about sandy clay loam, clay loam, silty clay, silt loam. All those are common terms used by scientists out in the soil field. <clears throat> if I was to classify a soil, let's just say 30% silt, 30% sand, 30% clay, you use this graph to find, let's just say 30% sand, 30% uh, 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 silt, and 30% clay all come together right here in clay loam. And that's what you would classify that soil as. Uh, you can take soil samples, use your eyes and other instruments to see the different size of particles, and determine how much sand, silk, clay, and organic matter you have in soils. Uh, there's many universities that will also test your soil for you, including Michigan State, Ohio State, a lot of them on the East Coast uh, will take soil samples for sale. It costs like 25 bucks. Soil density. 
uh, permeability, particle density, bulk density, soil porosity. These are all scientific terms for measurements of soil. Uh, it's going to measure the size and shape, um, uh, the ability of the soil to drain, the ability of the soil to hold air and nutrients. Those are all different combinations that you can have. Uh, some things that we should take and from this whole thing, uh, never really work on wet or dr super dry soils. If you're out in your garden and it's raining, try not to walk around and pull weeds that day. Uh, you're going to create a bunch of compaction. It's going to be hard for those roots to breathe. It's going to be hard for them to grow, spread out, um, avoid unnecessary traffic, minimal tillage over the soil. Every time you till the soil, you break it up, you let air in. Uh, yes, it's good, but you're ruining a lot of, of good stuff too. You're ruining a lot of fungi, uh, worms, the ability for that soil to maintain its temperature. It heats up a lot more. Wind can blow uh, freshly tilled soil away really easy. You should always keep your soil covered, whether it be a cover crop or some kind of mulch. Um, Any time that we keep that soil covered, it, it keeps that microbial life alive down there. Um, always add organic matter if you can, compost, lawn clippings, um, wood mulch, bales of straw, all of that help the soil stay together uh, from being washed away from erosion, uh, nutrients from leaching into our waterways, I know all of us living here close to the Maumee River uh, think about that a lot. Uh, we all had warnings of not to drink the city of Toledo water, you know, a few years back. Um, all of that has to do with, with soil and runoff and trying to use best management practices to not let that stuff go to waste. Uh, a farmer's biggest cost is nutrients and farmers don't want to waste their money. Uh, so they're not going to let that leach into the, the lake willingly. You know what I mean? They're all willing to work the right, right, right tools. Uh, soil temperature, okay? Uh, this affects germination. It affects nutrient uptake. Uh, there's an example there. Corn germinates best in warm soil. Peas, uh, little snow peas, they prefer the cold soil. Uh, and you can manipulate this as a grower uh, in the early season if you use uh, wood chips or mulch and you lay it down. We all know what that creates. It creates microbial activity, it creates warmth, it creates heat. Uh, that microbial activity heats the soil up quicker. Uh, so uh, also things like plastic mulch. If you go out to California and see how they grow or even a lot of the traditional for-profit vegetable farms use what's called plastic mulch. It is a, a roll of plastic like panda film that they lay in rows, uh, they bury it and, and then they plant into it. Um, that plastic mulch heats up from the sun. A lot of watermelon growers use black plastic mulch because watermelon soil temperature needs to be up high quick to get those watermelons before anybody else. Um, also, uh, let's see here. Some growers use white plastic mulch too and they say that that can deter pest and disease. Uh, so there's lots of different things like that. This is a color system that scientists use to determine the type and makeup of your soil, okay? They, they look at the actual color of your soil. Grays mean clays, browns mean sand, uh, reds mean phosphorus, uh, clay. Life in the soil, guys. There's a huge soil food web. Um, when you, when you look at from groundhogs all the way down to nematodes, there's an unbelievable amount of, of plants and animals in soil, guys. Uh, every acre of soil, two or more tons of living things live in an acre of soil. Uh, it's kind of ridiculous to even think about. Uh, as many as 100 million bacteria are present in just one teaspoon of soil. That is a ridiculous number. Um, bacteria are the most abundant. Fungi are less numerous, but they're larger in size. Uh, mycelium really helps break down minerals. It works to transfer those minerals. Uh, fungi is known to even go from, from plant to plant. If this plant needs it, this plant has it, that fungi and hyphae can actually deliver that. Uh, so it's very important to increase microbial activity, uh, organic material whenever possible. Um, Phosphorus in particular is, is 
a hard one, guys. Phosphorus out of all the other nutrients is, is a little bit trickier. Uh, phosphorus is what a lot of us use when it comes to develop flowers, when it comes to blowing roots for clones. Uh, phosphorus is that guy. Uh, out of all the nutrients and their positive and negative charges, phosphorus is, is, is hard one to soak up. Uh, it doesn't transfer through the soil very easily in solution when it rains and there's phosphorus in the soil. It doesn't really move very easily, uh, maybe like a quarter inch or something like that. So, you know, we'll, we'll go further with phosphorus here in a second. Um, but mycorrhizae is very, very studied when it comes to phosphorus uptake. Uh, and that's the reason why I brought up some of these ingredients here is because mammoth P, the P actually stands for phosphorus. This is a microbial that's specifically designed to help uptake phosphorus in your soil. Same thing with king crab. This is it, specifically phosphate of micronutrients. I knew it was on a label there somewhere. Uh, how to improve the life of the soil? Obviously, add organic matter as much as possible. Crop residues. When I say crop residues, that's what's left over after you went through a field and, and harvested beans or corn. All that stuff left over is crop residue. It's organic matter. It's good. Um, years ago, we used to harvest the corn and then take it and shell it somewhere else uh, and have all that waste to get rid of. Nowadays, we shell the corn right in the field when we harvest and just spit it all out the back of the tractor. Um, cover crops, green manures, um, compost. Uh, anytime you see the word sludge or bio waste, guys, they're talking about human waste. Um, there's huge studies being put out right now on how to help mitigate human waste. We create a lot of waste in, it's not necessarily the best thing to put on our food crops. Um, it's easy to get sick from doing stuff like that, uh, especially for humans. So we take other animals like fish and, and uh, a cow and, and horse manure because they're totally different animals and what's in their stomachs uh, Bacteria-wise, doesn't really affect us like like human excrement would be in, in our fields. Uh, so <clears throat> try not to do that uh, in in our food crops. Uh, but uh, flowers all day long. Um, reduce tillage always. Improve drainage. Um, you can always try to limit runoff as much as possible. Uh, water going into the street and in the sewer is, is not as well as, as water going into a ditch or a rain garden or somewhere that it can actually filter. Um, minimize fallow. Fallow is keeping your field bare uh, after you harvest. It, it's, it's an open field that the wind can now just carry your topsoil away. Most topsoil, guys, is only a couple inches thick. Uh, that's all we have, and it doesn't get replaced fast enough for it to just blow away. Um, especially when you go out to the country and you see the, the vast fields and the high winds, you, you can see how it makes sense that if you left that field bare and we got some high winds, it could fill up that ditch with all the topsoil that, that just came across or, or be in the road, for instance. Uh, increase habitat diversity, crop rotation to uh, all the farmers around here practice some sort of crop rotation. You're not going to do corn, 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 corn. It's not going to happen. Um, controlling harmful organisms. There's good stuff and there's bad stuff, all right? There's good mycorrhizae that deliver phosphorus to your roots. There's root rot and other viruses and things that get into your plant as well. So we gotta try and mitigate them the best way we can. Um, sometimes before planting, uh, you'll see farmers put a big giant tarp out on their land, uh, sometimes black. This helps to uh, solarize it or get it too hot to kill weed seeds or bad bacteria and stuff like that in the soil. Uh, so a lot of um, even um, more <laughs> extravagant operations will actually pull that media and steam it and drop it back down. It, it totally sterilizes it. Uh, especially if you're going through problems with root rot, uh, septoria, different bacteria in the soil that you can't get rid of. Quarantines, guys, we, we quarantine plants for a reason uh, and, and you just have to stick to it. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, sometimes it takes a little bit extra, but, but they're intended to prevent all this stuff from happening in the first place. Soil pH, you get it too much one way, too much another way, you're just feeding bad stuff 
uh, bad bacteria, uh, bad fungi, uh, heavy metals. Uh, so plants uptake nutrients, they will also uptake heavy metals, uh, lead, cyanide, uh, different things like that, that is absolutely poisonous for us. Uh, so it's important to keep your soil pH correct because going one way or the other can definitely allow those bad metals to get up in there too, if they're present. Um, living pesticides, bacteria and fungi. Uh, we did a workshop with the plantsman for all the living beneficial bugs you can use. That applies on a, a microbial level too, guys. The recharge, the great white, uh, the mycos, all that stuff matters. Uh, all that stuff helps build resistance. The more good bacteria, this is a war going on, uh, the better you're gonna be. It'll fight off the bad. You can also select crops that are highly resistant, especially for the zone that you're in. Um, if you're growing tomatoes for profit, you're gonna specifically select for ones that are resistant to powdery mildew and viruses being in this region. Uh, you're gonna go to a college or university and, and figure out what tomato they've researched so that you can grow and actually make money off of it. Um, organic matter, it's classified in three different stages. Um, it begins with all the living stuff in the organic matter, okay? The roots, the microbes, the other organisms, the little crickets, worms, you name it. They're all that living part of the organic matter. Um, fragments of plant and animal remains are next. Uh, various stages of decay, fallen leaves, uh, dead organisms, uh, animal scat. Um, a lot of the residues left over from the previous year, uh, that adds to the organic matter. All of this in, in final stages uh, ends up turning into what's called hummus, humus, humus, not hummus. Hummus is what monets have. Uh, humus is, is what we compare to like a, a bag of worm castings or something that's dark, black, dense. It's just nothing but, but life. It's what's done after the compost pile has done what it does. Uh, you have what's called humus. Um, lower temperatures promote organic matter, uh, rain, fine textured soils, they all keep organic matter from being washed away or eroded. When you start raising temperatures, that organic matter starts to break down a lot faster. So when you go up to these places in the world with the most organic matter, you're looking at like Canadian peat bogs. Uh, things that are very anaerobic, high concentrations of, of organic matter that's just been building up year after year after year after year. And they can have hundreds of feet deep layers of organic matter. Um, all of this organic matter is, is referred to in the science field as detritus. Uh, it's just decaying plant and animal parts. Organic matter, what its functions are, why do we want it? Uh, you can see this picture up here is erosion. Uh, that's heavy rain, water runoff, uh, and that's what it does over time. Uh, that's how the Grand Canyon was built. That's how Niagara Falls exists. Uh, that's erosion. This is done more by wind than it is water. Um, Organic matter dramatically improves the soil's ability to hold on to and store nutrients in water. I tell customers that all the time. Uh, organic matter is a sponge. Uh, it has an electric charge that sucks nutrients into it and holds on to it. Uh, and then when you go to rewater, those nutrients don't get leached out, but they can be absorbed by the plant root. Uh, so there's a fine line there between being stuck onto those soil particles or actually letting the plant use them. Uh, I talked about horizons or layers in the soil. That first layer of the soil scientists refer to is always called the O-horizon. It's the organic layer. Uh, it's all the leaf litter, organic material. It's everything on the surface of the soil. Generally, that O layer is not much more than a couple inches thick, guys, even in the best conditions. You know, but that's the same stuff where 100 million bacteria in one teaspoon. You know, so a little bit goes a long way. We're gonna get into water. Uh, water affects soil. Uh, soil is affected by water. Different textures of soils can hold water better than others. Uh, clay holds onto water the best. 
sand can't hold on to water very easily. So, how are you doing? Good. Welcome. Good class, everybody. All these different terms, uh, adhesion, cohesion, anaerobic means no air, capillary rise, field capacity, gravitational flow, osmotic potential, anything you see the word osmosis, that means water. Um, we're talking about wilting points, saturation, water content. Uh, it's all stuff that is, is science terms that are easy to understand once you get your mind wrapped around them. What we should know about water. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit in depth about water even though it's soil science, but I hope you understand why. Um, if you forget to fertilize your plant, it survives. If you forget to water it, it dies, okay? Um, plant cells are water, okay? That whole plant is made up of water. The ability for that plant to hold itself up with that water is, is a firm, uh, it's called turgid, it's being turgid. If you start to wilt, you, you lose, lose your, your turgid, turgidity. <laughs> um, photosynthesis uses water, okay? Uh, it's the way that plants produce energy, uh, transpiration, uh, evaporation of water from the leaf, okay? Transportation is what cools the plant. So if you want more water uptake in your plants, you must make a hotter environment, period. Uh, you could make your nutrient solution stronger uh, if you wanted to because you're having less uptake. But overall, uh, what's gonna make that plant work harder is getting the temperatures up. <clears throat> Plant nutrients, all right, they are dissolved in water. Uh, they move towards the root through water. Uh, water is important, making nutrients available to plants. Without water, the nutrients don't really move very easily in the soil. Uh, the roots have to go find them. Uh, water carries materials such as nutrients and carbs throughout the plant's vascular system. So, just like we have a vascular system of veins uh, that carry uh, blood, nutrients, oxygen through our body, plants have the same thing, guys. Uh, they have a vascular system. Uh, a lot of times you got a plant in a hot summer day and you break it, you're gonna see water or moisture develop on that very quickly and that's the vascular system pulling water up from the roots. Uh, some trees can pull up hundreds of gallons per day. It's ridiculous. Uh, trees really help clean things. Um, moist soil has lower strength than dry soil. So dry, hard soil roots can't grow through as easily as like moist soil. Roots have a very easy time to kind of slip through that moist soil. Uh, and moisture is required for microbes. Guys, you'll never have good microbial activity in something that got too dry. Uh, saturation, when you fill the whole container, when you fill the whole garden bed until it can't take no more, that's saturation. Gravitational water is everything that runs off from that pot after I watered it uh, and what's left over. So everything that runs off is a gravitational water. Uh, what's left over uh, would be that saturation, that field capacity. Um, wilting point is pretty self-explanatory, guys, when plants use up all the water you put in their pot, they'll start to wilt. Uh, there's a wilting point, there's a permanent wilting point that you can't turn back from. Uh, so sometimes we catch our plants wilting and we can save them. Uh, if you catch your plant at its permanent wilting point, you are not going to save it. Um, we're going to talk about adhesion and cohesion. All right, so adhesion is that soil's ability to hold on to water. It's, it's, that soil needs that water to do what it does. Uh, and then we have the, the cohesion. There's, there's more water that that soil can hold, but it doesn't need it like it does that adhesion water. Uh, so, you know, um, cohesion water is water that the plants can take. Um, capillary action or a capillary thin tubes. Um, this is how plants uptake water. This is how hydraulics work on forklifts. This is how uh, a paper towel can soak up water by touching it you know, against gravity. Um, so capillary action is one of the main ways that plants will uptake water into their roots. Uh, and we talk about water potential. 
uh, soil water potential. It, it, this is a measurement. It's a concept by scientists, guys, this soil water potential. It's the amount of water uh, that's in the soil. Um, but more than anything, it, it's the potential of that water. So it, you can saturate sand, you can saturate clay. Uh, clay holds onto that water way more than sand does. So you can have the same amount of water in both containers. You're gonna get way more usable or, or available water out of that sand than you would that clay. It's clay's holding on to it. Uh, so there's different soil types that have different water potential, water availability. It's water to work with. We're still on water, guys. Um, <clears throat> I wish I could see these charts a little bit better, but you can see soil types here. Uh, after you saturate, there is all of this water. There's gravitational runoff. There is a series of available water for the plant, and then before it dries down so much that the soil is not gonna let it go anymore. Uh, so there's a, a clay soils you'll see will, will hold the most water and the most unavailable water uh, and you'll see as you work towards the middle, those loamy soils, those sandy loam soils have the most available water compared to, to most of the other soil, soil structures. Um, and I guess I just ran through that. Uh, clay holds most water, less available. Uh, sand holds least water, uh, but it's more cohesive water. It's more water for the plants. Um, it's easier for plants to remove water from sandy soils. Um, silt, this is a lot of times where people are like, well, what does silt do? Silt, soils high in silt hold large amounts of plant available water. So silt can hold water and it can also give it up to the plant easier than any kind of clay or sand. Um, so that's another reason why we like a mixture of all these three different particles in our, our substrates. Um, when we run high EC, uh, high salt soils, um, we must saturate more often. Salt, uh, water, they're all electronically charged. Hydrogen, oxygen, they all have positives and negatives. Um, when you have high salt content in your media, water doesn't transfer to the plants very easily. This is the reason why when you over fertilize, your plant wilts and dies. You put so much salt into that media that it is now sucking water out of your plant. Um, that's what over fertilization is. Uh, the plant doesn't have the ability or the available water uh, to do what it does. Uh, so a lot of times when we, we run our high ECs, you, you can't dry back too much. You're really going to mess things up, um, especially with the salty soils when we're, you know, a lot of times in that boom phase. Water conservation, guys, it, it's the same thing as soil. Uh, there's only so much fresh water on this planet, so we want to do what we can to conserve water. Uh, this helps us reduce nutrient cost. It helps us get a, a better harvest ultimately overall. Um, by 2025, estimated three and a half billion people, nearly half the world's population will face water shortages. This is a uh, statistic from the NRCS, the National uh, Resources for Soil Science. Um, reducing water reduces runoff, uh, warm, dry air and wind all contribute heavy to evapotranspiration. Does anybody know what evapotranspiration is? Evaporation. Plus? <laughs> Through transpiration produced by all right. plants. Okay, yep. So plants transpire water into the air. Uh, the sun also evaporates water off of the soil. Both that evaporation and the plant's evaporation together is called evapotranspiration. So it's the amount of evaporation from the, the soil and the plant together uh, is evapotranspiration. And that's essentially the number you're looking for when you're sizing quests for your indoor garden as well. Um, you want to make sure that you can not only evaporate what the plants are putting off, but also evaporate what's coming off them, that top of the media that you've just saturated. Um, that all comes into play. When you're sizing the DHU, Go bigger. That's all I have to say. Go bigger. Uh, drainage and irrigation. Poor drainage creates anaerobic conditions. This deprives roots of oxygen. Roots need oxygen. Um, 
root tips and hairs are quickly damaged if you don't let air get to them. Uh, they're also quickly damaged when you let them dry out too much. Uh, so this is a fine line to, to ride here, guys. Um, poor drained soils, uh, they don't heat up as well either. Uh, they lay wetter longer into the spring. Uh, so it delays planting. It can really stipend a farmer's budget if he's in low lying soils. If all your buddies are getting their lettuce and tomatoes out before you can get yours even in, you're in trouble. Um, drainage and irrigation, guys, there's so many different kinds of irrigation. We even see those big giant sprinklers when we're driving down the road here in farm fields. Uh, there's many, many different drip tapes and floods and drains, depending on what crop you're doing um, out in agriculture. Um, the one that we typically tend to cater to here is drip irrigation. Um, Israel came up with it. Israel is where Netafim is based uh, and founded. Um, they are far ahead of us in irrigation and hydroponic growing than what we could imagine. Um, they don't really have the land that we have. We are very, very spoiled here in the United States. Uh, we don't need to get smart at hydroponics yet. Um, although a lot of our crop production comes from Canada here in Michigan, most of it comes from California and other parts of the United States. Um, drip irrigation, it's generally the most efficient. Uh, it's widely used greenhouse nursery, especially with potted plants. It's hard to run a, a drip tape that uh, has a hole every 12 inches and, and get pots underneath it all. Uh, it's hard to and definitely not economical to put pots underneath a sprinkler like that. Um, you do that top-down watering, it leads to pest and disease problems. Uh, if you can just deliver that moisture to the soil instead of putting it all over the leaves of the plant, it really helps, especially on hot summer days. Drip irrigation is worth that. Soil fertility, guys. Um, plant nutrition. Uh, there's things called cation exchange capacity. There's a colloid, which is just like a, a piece of clay or organic matter. Uh, essential elements, macro, micronutrients. There's ions. All these nutrients are positively and negatively charged ions. Uh, trace elements, those are the micros, the ones that are used in very, very, very small amounts, uh, more metal than anything. And, and when you see essential elements on one of these charts, they're in order from, from most used to least used. Uh, these are all the macros, these are the micros. You look at the last of the micros, uh, these trace elements, and, and you see there's just, it's, it's one metal after the other. Uh, but they're used in very, 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 very small amounts, uh, and quite often what we refer to as chelated or you know, gone through some kind of conversion with organic matter before they're absorbed by plants. Uh, so you, you, you need that organic matter a lot of times to get your trace elements. Unless they're in your bags of Athena or something already, you know? Uh, soil fertility. This is where we get kind of greasy here and learn some things. Uh, the essential elements. All right, plants absorb up to 90 different elements, okay? Only 17 are essential for growth. There's elements that science deem essential where if you didn't have one of those 17 that plant's not going to do what it's supposed to do uh, so there's there's 90 different elements that plants take up only 17 are what they need so a lot of the things that we sell in the store here have those 17 in them if you follow the schedule there's a lot of those products that have these extra additives uh, those are part of that 90 different elements that plants still use okay uh, we don't necessarily have to only give them what they need in these 17 elements, we can add quite a few more and get some cool shit out of it. Um, macronutrients, uh, used in large amounts, least to greatest. Um, and those are, the first three are not even in the soil. They get those out of the air, CO2, uh, water, and oxygen. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, the top three, the big three, uh, ones that are used most. Um, Micronutrients, layer after. All right, nutrients are in the form of ions. We talked about this. The charge either positive or negative. 
So positive ions called cations, negative anion called anions. Almost all nutrients are cations. Almost all of them are positively charged. Uh, plant roots absorb nutrient ions. Soil particles absorb nutrient ions. Organic matter absorbs nutrient ions. Uh, they stay in solution in the soil like a sponge. Uh, the more organic matter, the more um, clay type substances you have in the soil, uh, the more nutrients it's gonna hold uh, for the plants. When you're trying to build a soil to hold enough nutrients for the entire life of that plant, you're gonna want high cation exchange capacity. You're gonna want high availability for those nutrients to stay in that soil. Um, we, we talked about these, these colloid term, it's either clay or, or compost. Uh, and, and tiny clay and compost particles, they carry this little slight electrical charge. Uh, these charges grab nutrients and hold them. This cation exchange capacity, CEC, guys, this is dramatically demonstrated here between clay and sand. And I know it's hard to see because it's very fuzzy, uh, but sand does not have nowhere near the ability to grab and hold nutrients as a clay particle does. Um, and you can, under a microscope, see that clay looks kind of like a piece of perlite. It's got holes everywhere and ridges everywhere. It's got places to grab things um, where sand is not, can't hold water, can't hold nutrients, can't hold nothing. Um, biggest thing to take out of this uh, is, is the nutrients are attached and absorbed and banked for when plants need them. Um, they profoundly influence the soils and how we manage them. Uh, sandy soils are gonna need fertilized a lot more than clay soils. They're gonna need watered a lot more than clay soils. Uh, so if you have a 100 acre field and it's very, very clay in the back, uh, you will adjust your fertilizer before you get to that back part of that field. Um, the ability to the soil to hold nutrients relates to the number of cations it can attract in the soil. So the value is determined. There's a scientific number that you can calculate based on your soil texture as to how much cation exchange capacity you have. You can add or take away. Uh, if I add more sand, I'm taking away the cation exchange capacity. Add more organic matter, you're adding to that cation exchange capacity. Uh, it, to a limit, guys, you know, to a limit to where things don't dry back good, to where you affect root growth because there's not enough oxygen. Uh, you know, so there's, there's limits to this stuff too. Um, highest to least cation exchange, obviously the highest CEC is found in clay loam, silt loam, loam. That's where you have this mixture of sand, silt, and clay that a lot of us as growers like. That's high cation exchange capacity. The highest CECs are found in those uh, Canadian peat bogs that I mentioned. They have the most organic materials. They have the most ability to act like a sponge and hang on to nutrients. Um, followed by the, the last being loamy sand. All right, there's different factors in the soil that affect uptake, okay? The three main ones, oxygen, water, and soil, okay? Um, my plants aren't getting enough nutrients. The biggest thing I'm always gonna look at, oxygen, water, and soil. Um, active nutrient uptake consumes energy. Uh, the roots actually do breathe, guys. Roots in the plants breathe. Uh, they respire, they use oxygen, believe it or not. Um, so um, roots use energy when they breathe uh, and that helps to, um, shit, I forgot where I was going. Food that happens to fuel the root respiration is produced in the leaves during photosynthesis. Okay, this, and, and delivered to the roots uh, and the plant's veins, the vascular system. Uh, so, you know, um, the photosynthesis helps roots uptake more nutrients. Uh, anything that interferes with any step of this process will reduce nutrient uptake. For instance, plants growing under low light make less sugar, less photosynthesis less the roots can work with to absorb more moisture. So low light, your plants are not gonna be able to uptake as many nutrients. You might as well not feed them that much. It's just gonna run off. Um, 
Root respiration uses oxygen, conditions that limit oxygen, uh, supersaturated soils, they're gonna limit nutrient uptake for drainage, soil compaction, uh, anything that's gonna reduce oxygen in the root zone is going to slow uh, growth down. Dry soil affects nutrient uptake as well. Uh, lack of water impedes nutrient flow to the root hairs. Uh, phosphorus in particular, guys, like I said, it doesn't move very easy throughout the soil. Uh, dramatically reduced by dry soils. If you let your room dry back too far, especially in the beginning stages of bloom, you will regret it. It will affect the whole entire run. Uh, you won't be able to catch up. Uh, you'll wonder why you don't have big flowers. Uh, soil temperature affects nutrient uptake. Um, the rates of all these chemical reactions that we talk about, these cycles, uh, including those in soil and plants, depend on temperature. The more temperature goes up, the more these chemical reactions can take place, okay? The, the warmer we can make the root zone, the, the more reactions are gonna happen. Uh, we have to balance all that out with oxygen and, and water. Um, so, once again, phosphorus and iron, they're very, very common for early deficiencies when farmers are planting their corn and beans and trying to get it in early. Uh, they quite often will come across phosphorus deficiencies because it's too cold. Uh, the warmer the soil temps, uh, they improve your nutrient uptake up to around 85 degrees. Beyond that, uh, uptake declines. Uh, this is a staggering number. A lot of guys are like, I would never want my root zone to be 85 degrees. Uh, this is also, you know, plant specific. Uh, it's a general figure. Uh, obviously, oxygen content goes down dramatically at that temperature. Uh, if I was in a deep water culture, I would never want to be 85 degrees ever. Um, increase in the amount of nutrients in the soil can increase uptake. This is why we fertilize our plants. We give them more nutrients because they can take up more. Uh, drainage, compaction, uh, fertilization, it all influences the way roots grow. Plants with long root depth require less fertilizers. If your roots will go all the way down further in the soil, uh, they don't dry out as easy, they have access to more nutrients. Uh, plants with long roots don't need fertilized as much. Uh, organisms in the root zone can dramatically impact nutrient uptake. Soil-borne pathogens, fungi, uh, they can damage the ability to uptake roots. While in the same sense, your microbes and bacteria, your mycorrhizae fungi, uh, it can also aid in, in nutrient uptake, especially, especially phosphorus, guys. Um, insects, on the other hand, uh, they eat your roots. pH, we're moving along, guys. Uh, once we finish with this soil, we're going to take like a little small break before we dive into plants. Plants is not, I mean, plant science and soil science go hand in hand. Uh, when you talk about one, you're going to talk a lot about the other. Uh, when we do soil science or, or plant science after this, it's not going to be as vigorous. It's not going to be as rigorous. You, you're kind of going to be familiar with a lot of it already. Um, pH scale. Uh, we all ask about pH and why. Uh, we have these charts up front on the counters uh, where this lists all the nutrients that plants use, uh, all 14 of them. Uh, and then as you move your pH acidic or basic, these nutrients become more and more available or less and less available. Uh, you start to get lower pH, you start to really knock off your calcium and magnesium. Uh, people come in all the time and they show pictures of their plants with a calcium and magnesium deficiency. Just raise your pH a little bit, you'll be just fine. I don't have to sell you a $20 bottle of CalMag. Uh, also with the pH scale, and you let the pH go down too far, we talked about absorbing nutrients that are harmful, uh, toxic to humans. Uh, you get a lower pH and you get things like high aluminum content. Uh, and that is, I think, well known for uh, ruining our brains. <coughs> Different terms, ag line, alkaline, basic, they're all the same thing. Alkaline, basic, high pH, it's it. Low pH, acidic, uh, those are all the same terms. Um, native pH is not always desirable. If you've got limestone as your bedrock, your pH is gonna be quite high. Uh, so people do things to change pH. Uh, they bring in more medias, they use things like sulfur, they use things like lime, 
um, to increase, to lower, to stabilize pH depending on what they're growing and where they come from. Um, most extreme pH values found in the United States, uh, 3.5 is as low as they go and 10.5 is as high as they go. Uh, as growers, we got to be somewhere between that 5 and 8 for things to work out, guys. Um, most plants in mineral soils outside in the ground, sand, silt, and clay, uh, they're going to be around 6 to 7. Or organic soils uh, or any bag in this store, you're going to be somewhere around 5.5 to 6.5 and, and be better off. Acid soils, low pH, uh, they affect the ability of phosphorus, um, other nutrients, freeing toxic levels of aluminum, other metals. Uh, alkaline soils, high pH, they make several micronutrients unavailable, uh, those small little nutrients that we do need. Uh, so we can't make those unavailable. We've got to keep the pH in line. Um, lime is what's often used for pH up or bicarbonate or baking soda. Uh, that's what this is. Uh, and then phosphoric acid is quite often used to, to lower pH uh, or even sulfur. Uh, sulfur is what uh, we'll use in pellet form on like uh, blueberry farms or azaleas. They'll change the color of flowers because they change the, the pH of the soil. Uh, gypsum. Gypsum, guys, we can't forget about what gypsum does, all right? Gypsum, I spelled it wrong. It is absolutely calcium sulfate. That's what gypsum is. So when you want to add calcium, uh, when you want to add sulfur, uh, add some gypsum. Uh, it's very low and slow to be absorbed by plants. It's going to take some time. That gypsum lasts a long time. Um, gypsum dramatically reduces salt content in your soil. Uh, you're getting a little bit too salty and you want to get rid of some of that salt, you're going to top dress or you're going to feed with some sort of gypsum. Uh, there's a chemical reaction between the calcium uh, that will knock that salt right out of there. Uh, a lot of times as an organic grower that builds your own soils, right around day 45, 48, you're going to top dress with gypsum. That's going to give you the sulfur that you need, the calcium that you need to stop bud rot, uh, to finish out with good taste in your bud. You know, gypsum is your friend. So is sulfur, by the way. Uh, 14 nutrients perform important basic tasks of the plant. And PK is the top three. I think we talked about that. Nitrogen. Uh, it promotes rapid succulent growth, the green growth. Uh, everything that's green on your plant is there because of nitrogen. Uh, phosphorus. It, it gives that early root growth. Uh, it's used in a lot of the, the clonexes or the um, rooting formulas, uh, starting formulas from Jacks or something like that. Uh, it, it's high in phosphorus. Uh, resistance to pests, weather damage. Potassium is the same thing. It, it provides a tough plant. Uh, that same resistance uh, uh, for drought uh, and pest. If you don't feed plants a balance of these three nutrients, uh, you will not get strong, vigorous, healthy growth. Uh, secondary nutrients, the calcium, the sulfur, the magnesium, that cow mag that we all talk about, uh, those are also highly used by plants, um, but not as much as that first big three, that MPK. Every bottle in this store has an MPK value on it. Uh, they all have and those are percentages. If you have a 374, that's 3% nitrogen, 7% phosphorus, 4% potassium. Uh, and it'll be like that across the board. So you can have a 10-10-10. A it's the same thing as a 30-30-30. You just need to add a little bit more. Same exact thing. Uh, phosphorus is special in plant nutrition, guys. We can't talk about this enough. Uh, phosphorus is most free at uh, a pH range of 6.5 to 6.8. Uh, so when you're trying to run those low pHs and you're having a small onset of bud or your roots aren't blowing on your clones, um, try and maybe raise that pH a little bit and see what happens. Uh, oxygen is needed, especially for this phosphorus. Uh, we talked about dry soils. Um, roots need oxygen to uptake nutrients. Uh, well-drained soil improves phosphorus uptake while compacted, poorly drained soils reduces the access. Uh, cold, cold very much slows down uh, microorganisms that are responsible for phosphorus uptake. Uh, this mammoth pea, this king crab, 
it acts a lot slower in the cold than it does in the warmth, uh, as do I. Um, Mycorrhizae, uh, it infects plant roots. It helps, guys, and that's why that picture is there showing all this mushroom fungus with that tree root. Uh, it, it helps deficient soils. It transfers nutrients. It, it really helps move things around for the plants. Uh, it almost looks like an extra root system here that those mushrooms provide, and they can link for uh, miles. It's, it's debatable by science that uh, uh, this, this fungi or this mycorrhizae is, is the largest living organism in the world because it can stretch for miles underground. Plant nutrition. All right, guys, we're coming down to it. Plants grow best when each nutrient is present in the right amount. Uh, lack of any one nutrient causes poor or abnormal growth. In addition, plants need a balance of nutrients. To achieve this balance, uh, soil test, soil test, soil test. All right, if you're not outside in the ground doing soil tests, you should be following your feed schedule to the best of your ability. Every brand name of nutrients that you go with has a prescribed amount that you're supposed to give at any given time. You put that in relevation with the amount of light, the soil texture, and everything else, and you'll come out with a good recipe. Um, follow your feed schedule to the best of your ability before you change anything up. All right, the end, guys. Let's talk. We can talk about potting mixes versus mineral soil. Uh, why don't we use mineral soil in nursery pots in the greenhouses? Uh, because sand, silt, and clay uses all the rest of the soil that it's in to help disperse water, whether it be capillary action or gravity. When you put sand, silt, and clay in a pot and you hang it up and you put flowers in it, and you water it and you water it and you water it, uh, before long you'll get a hard pan that develops. And that hard pan stops anything from draining anymore. Now all of a sudden you'll have an anaerobic environment in your root zone. All right, so uh, we lighten up mineral soils uh, in Quite often we leave them out entirely when we're in nursery production and we go with almost entirely organic materials. Cocoa, peat moss, grodan, uh, that's all nothing to do with soil minerals. <laughs> we feed them through irrigation uh, and then we use organic materials in our pots because of high cation exchange, high oxygen content, better drybacks. Um, sand, silt, and clay just don't work the way that that it, uh, uh, it does outside with the ground as it does inside in pots. Um, being attached to the ground helps it disperse what it does and not form those hard pans and horizons. Um, vegetables need to be in well-drained, well-balanced nutrition potting mixes. Um, potting mixes change rapidly, pH and EC, because we're constantly watering them. Uh, that's it, guys. Craig and Heather helped me with this, guys. They've treated me so well over the years. They've been so good to me uh, that I wouldn't be able to do this without Toledo Indoor Garden. Uh, so I like to share all my information with you guys here. Um, you guys can feel free to call, text, email. Uh, I'll make Craig get back with you at his earliest convenience, and we'll go from there. But is there any questions or anything like that over some of the soil science? Did I do a good job at all? Did a good yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad ass job. All right. Yeah, guys, as he was saying, I think everybody that works here was a customer at one point in time. Craig started, he was just himself. Uh, and slowly grew with his customers for the most part. Uh, quite, quite cool. Um, I watched Craig open his first shop uh, and I had one light in my basement and I needed help. And Craig was like, I'll give you a deal. <laughs> and I bought a bale of soil that had a hole in the bag and he was like, I'll give you a discount. And we just went from there and, and, I, and I felt like I always felt like Craig was my man. I, he didn't know me, but I knew him. And I always felt like he gave me deals when I came there. And that's kind of why a lot of people shop with him. He, he goes out of his way to get you the best for the best. And he's kind of just grew that way. Uh, all Craig's friends all grew throughout the laws being changed in 2008. 
Um, I think all the customer support that he had back then, I mean, there was all a bunch of trappers and eventually uh, they were developed such a relationship that they all are now repeat and return customers for him. That He did such a good job over the years with his customers that these people are, are growing uh, and they're continuing to stay loyal to him uh, because he was so loyal to them back when it mattered. I've been a customer to every grow shop in Ohio and it's the best store. Ain't it crazy, man? You just, you get a better yeah. feeling of, of personalness here. You know? yeah. We're not trying to know your name and your business, but we're trying to help you. you know? And if you can't find it, we'll try and order it for you. And, and that was always good. You know, Craig's famous for the, it'll be here tomorrow, but he fucking orders shit that you need. And quite often it's <coughs> there the next day, but it'll be there soon, you know? Get it? Yeah. Plant science, guys, we can't exist without plants uh, because in order to live, we need plants. Uh, plants give us oxygen, we give plants CO2. It's called the symbiotic relationship. Without us, there's no them. Without them, there's no us. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, the drawing's pretty cool, it's not mine but it can go pretty in depth the more you look at it. Plant science. Uh, plants are the essential life on earth. They provide food, water, medicine, habitat, and more. Uh, plants maintain good soil conditions. They conserve moisture in the soil. Uh, they stop that evapotranspiration, that, that, uh, the evaporation uh, off the soil. Uh, plants filter. Uh, they absorb carbon dioxide, they produce oxygen. Uh, plants filter the water, they hold soil together. Uh, for a million reasons, plants are beneficial, guys. There's not many reasons uh, plants are not beneficial unless it's poison ivy. Um, there's two different classifications of plants. Uh, there's the woody plants and there's the herbaceous plants. Uh, herbaceous plants are generally workable they generally uh, die and grow back or, or or die and need replanted every year uh, they don't gain rings like a woody plant would uh, and they don't uh, store nutrients the way that woody plants do uh, here's kind of a rundown uh, of woody plants versus the herbaceous plants um, Plants that produce wood, okay? Uh, stuff that we burn and build with. They have strong stems, they're covered with bark. They're the tallest and largest plants on earth. Uh, they're mainly perennials. They come back year after year. Some woody plants aren't though. Um, herbaceous plants, uh, they have no real woody stem above the ground, sometimes below ground. It can be pretty woody, like the, the taproot of a dandelion or something like that, you know? Um, Stems usually stay green unless they're deficient or some sort. Uh, they have generally shorter and smaller. And they're generally annuals or uh, biannuals or perennials uh, coming back every couple of years or needing reseeded. Uh, woody plants have a totally different makeup than herbaceous plants. All right, the growth of a woody plant is already predetermined by its previous year. This is the biggest thing that, that kind of struck me going through this class is, is you're not gonna water or fertilize an apple tree and make it any better. What you're doing is making it better for next year. Um, you, can, you can take a branch, uh, and I meant to bring one in, uh, and you can look at woody tree stems, woody sticks, and you can follow these branches down and you'll actually see these scars on a, on a woody plant. Uh, and that was, how much it grow in one year. Uh, this is a scientific fact. Uh, it stores food and nutrients in that top bud. Uh, that's gonna be all of its growth for next year. Uh, and then during that time period, the year after and the year after. So you can count back by years on any woody stem or stick, uh, which is why they're thicker at the base and thinner at the tip. Uh, you can see how much, and you can tell if they had a bad year or a good year. Uh, because a bad year, these are going to grow not so much. A good year, you're going to get quite a bit of growth out of it. Um, you can look at the rings of a tree, and you can tell what years were good and what years were bad. 
uh, depending on the thickness between those rings. You can say that, man, back in 1985, it must have been a drought. You know, the tree didn't grow that much. Ah. Uh, parts of a woody stem. Uh, the main takeaway from this, uh, this center darker part of any woody tree is the pith. Uh, it stores food for the plant. Uh, and the outer, more uh, lighter colored wood are all these vascular bundles. That's where this vascular system takes place. Um, that that uh, layer just underneath the bark, uh, very thin layer. This cortex is where a lot of the water is taken up a tree. Um, if you strip the bark out from around a tree, you killed it. Uh, it no longer can uptake any water. A lot of times if a car hits a tree and messes up the bark, it's okay because there's still a lot of other bark that can send up uh, uh, water and nutrients. But if you go uh, too far or too much and strip back too much of this bark, uh, you will kill that tree, absolutely. Um, once again, parts of this woody plant, uh, and it's going to talk about the growth layers, those, those bundles. Uh, we'll get more into this xylem and phloem here in a second. Xylem and phloem is like the, the blood of a, a tree as compared to it would be a human. It, the xylem is the, the uptake of the nutrients, minerals, and water. The phloem is, is after the plant has made food, it's, it's sending the, the phloem and nutrients to different parts of the plants to make reactions and grow. Uh, herbaceous plants, okay, they don't have that, that woody stem, okay? They have this same little bundles uh, for xylem and phloem and a vascular system. Uh, but everything else is, is cells and cell walls uh, and turgidity, uh, stuff that makes things a little bit more firm uh, to stand up. But there's, there's, much, there's, there's different parts of a herbaceous plant than there are a woody plant. We're going to concentrate more on herbaceous plants because typically what we grow in vegetable gardens uh, I never went through a woody ID class in college, so I'm not too schooled in all that woody stuff. Uh, and I think more than anything, we're all here for herbaceous plants anyway. Um, <coughs> I want to grow a tree, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of these herbaceous plants can be male or female. Obviously, we know that. Um, but it, it's not just the crops that we know about that do that. Um, and then a lot of these herbaceous plants carry both female and male parts all on the same plant. Um, fruit is a seed bearing organ, guys. Um, fruit is not just apples and bananas. Fruit is, is peppers, it's tomatoes, it's, it's anything that bears a seed in the horticulture industry. Um, so if it produces a seed, it is a fruit producing organ. Um, Same sort of scenario and diagram, um, roots and shoots. Uh, roots and shoots are commonly referred to in the horticulture industry. Obviously roots being below soil and shoots being above. Uh, there's apical buds and tips and, and they carry all the DNA to reproduce this plant. Um, and it's not part of the vascular system. Uh, that's where all the plant uh, growth occurs in herbaceous plants is in the tips uh, in the meristems. Uh, there's nodes and there's internodes. Uh, nodes are where a branch comes out. Internodes is the space in between those branches. Uh, so you can uh, kind of manipulate your nodes and internodes with watering events and nutrients, uh, also light. Um, things like silica can make plants shorter and more stout. Um, higher light uh, intensity can keep plants shorter and more stout. Um, but ultimately, you know, um, there's not too much you can do to the genetics of the plant. All right, all these herbaceous plants are separated into two categories. Um, there's two categories, one being monocot, one being a dicot. Uh, those are the scientific terms. 
the monocot is what we refer to as a blade of grass or a, a, a corn. It is a single blade that comes up out of the seed uh, and it grows that way. The dicot is a single or two leaves that come up out of the seed. Uh, those are the two different types of plants. Almost everything that, that we know about and are more familiar with are dicots. Um, they all have this, this cotyledon, this, this first set of leaves that come out before their true leaves, and then they have their first set of true leaves, uh, easier to identify and grow and fertilize after those true leaves show up. Um, we're not gonna talk as much about grass and corn as we are the, the dicots. Um, they're virtually the same makeup. Uh, biggest thing to take is, is these bundles for the vascular system uh, difference uh, while, while the, the dicots are around the edge, the, the monocots are all in and through the tissue. Uh, there's no real uh, discrepancy between where the vascular system is compared to the dicots. Uh, they talk about flower petals and leaves and stuff like that, not as important. Uh, and this is a good example of what I was just talking about, these little bundles, uh, this xylem and phloem uh, versus in a monocot, they're everywhere. Dicots, they're only around the edges. <clears throat> Photosynthesis, guys, it's the way that plants make energy. Uh, these things are solar panels. Um, plants make energy, they make carbohydrates, they make biomass, they make nutrition for us um, through light, oxygen, and water, and CO2. Um, photosynthesis can increase and decrease uh, under certain stresses, mainly light intensity, CO2, and temperature. Um, obviously, we talked about this in soil science with temperature. When you decrease temperatures, you dramatically slow things down. Uh, when you increase uh, CO2, when you increase light intensity, you're giving that plant the ability to work harder. Um, but this is a balance. Uh, of those 17 uh, uh, nutrients that all plants need to grow, you need to balance all 17 of them and sometimes then more. <coughs> Um, this is just another example of the process of photosynthesis where the leaves are solar panels. They also take in CO2, but they give off clean oxygen and they store simple sugars. Um, this is a basically a map of how they make those sugars out of the sunlight. Uh, this is another cycle, like the water cycle or the nitrogen cycle. This is called the Calvin cycle. Uh, more than anything, and what you should take from this diagram is there is reactions that take place with the sunlight um, that create sugars, and there's also reactions that take place when there's no light, uh, where your plant still continues to grow in the dark. Uh, it is proven, it is possible, and your plants are still working even though the lights are off. Uh, this vascular system, this, this whole vein system, uh, you can kind of see this, this series of bundles right here, uh, one being the xylem, one being the phloem. Um, it, it's a complicated network of tissues, just like the veins in a human body. It, it connects all the organs. It, it transports water, minerals, nutrients, organic compounds, uh, various signals uh, and hormones uh, throughout the plant body and the veins of the plant. Uh, so it's just like our uh, vein system, uh, plants have it too, guys. Uh, there's two major tissues in this vascular system, the xylem and the phloem. Uh, the xylem, once again, it's the tissue that takes water and minerals from the roots and up to uh, the plant where it needs them to convert into uh, phloem, okay? So uh, this xylem, uh, water goes out the leaf, uh, oxygen goes out the leaf, transpiration, uh, and, and this Calvin process creates this, this phloem. <coughs> Pardon me. This is where the, the tissues get the food that they need, and now they can send that phloem throughout the plant. Um, some nutrients the plant can send a lot easier than others, uh, but all of those nutrients are in the phloem tissue. Uh, it's the food for the plant and it takes it to where it needs to go. Uh, it, but both of these are different from the meristematic tissue, the procambrium DNA, those little tips of the herbaceous plants where, 
where we do uh, tissue culture at, where we try to rid plants of, of pathogens and diseases and mildews and bugs. And when we take meristematic uh, tissue culture samples, we're reproducing that plant, uh, but we're not taking any of the xylem and phloem with it. Okay, that's how we get out of that virus and bacteria. Uh, we start that same plant over again with all new xylem and phloem. This is an example of the xylem and phloem. The xylem uh, can only take stuff one way, okay? It's around those bundles uh, in the stem of the plant, and it can only take water one way, uh, nutrients, solution, all that stuff. Uh, the phloem has the ability to go both ways. Uh, it can take and send, take and send, take and send nutrients and other things wherever it needs to go. Um, roots, uh, we're gonna talk about the, the, the roots, how they absorb. A uh, small demonstration of, of roots, and they have a, a tip that they grow from. They have these little root hairs that absorb most of the nutrients uh, that also bond with the, the fungus and different bacteria. Um, so there's a very small microscopic area here where all the magic happens. There's two different kinds of roots, tap roots and fibrous roots, guys. Uh, tap roots hold plants up. Uh, they keep plants standing tall in high winds. Fibrous roots are the ones responsible for the nutrient uptake, the water uptake, and all that stuff. So some plants you'll see, especially like dandelions, they have that tap root that goes down. Uh, that, that's there mainly just to <coughs> keep that plant up, keep that plant good, uh, and from blowing away. It has a bunch of little fibers that come out of it that are mostly for the, the water uptake. Um, parts of a flower, uh, moving on. Uh, the only reason plants have to grow are to reproduce. Uh, a plant has no other desire, uh, no other purpose other than to reproduce. That's what it's there for, and it, it does what it does trying to reproduce. That's it. Uh, so uh, all the benefits we get from plants, all they're trying to do is make another one. Um, parts of a flower are... Uh, they're all the reproductive organs. So a lot of plants, all the reproduction takes place in a flower. There's, there's an ovary, uh, there's an ovule, there's uh, these little sepals uh, that, that uh, I'm reminded of church for some reason. Uh, stamen and, and stigma, pistils, this is all where uh, pollen uh, hits this, this stigma uh, and then pollen goes down this stigma and uh, gets into that ovary just like uh, reproductive programs that we learned about in health school with humans. Um, so a lot of these flowers have both male and female traits um, and sometimes they don't. Uh, and it's all about the pollen on these uh, and the stigma together that can create seed. Um, this is a live living uh, plant and I picture was way better on my uh, computer but it, it describes this this flower petal um, and the the parts of it without being animated uh, and so every plant has the same parts they look a lot different from flower to flower um, but they're all the same parts with the same name um, Cannabis, um, most of the time the reproductive flower is, is, is obviously the, the female flower and it's the calyx, guys. Um, there's another, this resembles the, the male flower um, that releases the pollen, but there we have the cannabis pistillate flower. Um, there's the same, Obviously, when you guys find seeds, this is kind of how you find them. Uh, they grow inside that. Uh, that pollen, all it has to do is touch one of these little fine hairs right here. Uh, one little piece of pollen is all it takes. Uh, and boom, right? Now, does it affect the whole plant when it hits to go to seeding or just where it touches? Uh, it, 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 when, once it hits those little bracts, those little fibers, then it moves right down just like a piece of sperm. But I mean, does the whole plant gonna get seeded or just let's say just that right there? Oh, okay. Yep, yep. So, for instance, an ear of corn, 
uh, when an ear of corn comes up, it has all those little fine hairs that come out of that ear. The top of the corn has the little pollen uh, sacs on it. Uh, each little fine hair traces back to one kernel on that corn. If pollen doesn't touch all those little fine hairs, you will not get a full ear of corn. You'll get little seeds here and there for pollination. You should have planted more corn uh, or something like that. Um, but it, it, it will only make a seed in that one spot that gets fertilized. Uh, so you can fertilize one branch uh, with some pollen and get away with it. Um, you can have random seeds that are hermaphroditic traits uh, where they produce both the organs uh, just enough to make some seeds. Sometimes they're half formed seeds. Um, this is kind of a blurry opportunity as well. Uh, cell division and how plants grow. Um, cells divide and elongate. Uh, that's the easiest take from this is, is when plants grow, uh, obviously these are monocots or dicots? Dicots, right? Two leaves. Um, they grow in a spiral motion. So as this cell grows, the, the cells expand and they divide. So the cells expand and they divide, uh, and then they elongate. And I think that I have that. Okay, and then they elongate. So these are a plant cell, uh, and it's highly uh, directed by the sun as well. So when the sunlight um, um, hits these cells in this plant, they, they push molecules around, and actually this is how plants lean towards the sun uh, because of this, this cell elongation, this cell division process. A lot of times when you, you're constantly looking on plants, they, they actually will grow in a circle like this as they get taller. That's the, the cell elongation, that's the process of cell division. That's how all plants grow. Uh, if you put a plant on hyper speed and growth, you'll watch it spin in circles as it grows up. Yeah. I've uh, seen that, sped up videos of that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's also, this is the reason why plants tend to, to lean more towards the sun. Um, if they're by a window and they're stretching over towards that window, it, that's, that's what these molecules do. <clears throat> How plants use nutrients. I think we're getting down to it, guys. Oh, yeah, buddy. All right, I gotta wing it from here. Um, my computer didn't do as much for me as I want it to. Uh, there's not much. Yeah. <coughs> Any questions, guys? Any questions about plants and how they uptake nutrients? It's more of a, a water thing than anything that we covered in soil science. Um, I, I can go in depth on like which nutrient does what or how, but I don't think that that's as relevant. Uh, it can be easily researched as well. What about a pH in like when you're trying to be just organic? Because I always heard you should or you shouldn't. Like it's a big... That's true. Now, I also assimilate that with like your water source. Okay. Uh, well water, a lot of times in this area being higher in pH. Um, are you using RO water? RO water has the ability to kind of land on whatever pH it needs to be at. Yeah. So as long as you're using RO water, I would never pH it. Never pH ever. Okay, that, um, that's, that was gonna be my next question. Should I use tap or yep. RO water for? Correct. Um, yep. And and if I was using tap water, I would most definitely filter it, get it um, to try and keep my micro life from getting harmed by any kind of chlorine or you know chloramine or you know, fluoride or whatever at very low concentration is in that tap water. It could damage the microbes. It's like a whole house filter, you know. Um. It just, it's kind of preferential. I would test the PPMs, make sure that that whole house filter is getting you down below 100, let's say, um, and you'll be just fine. Just, there's a lot of guys out there that are pickier, that, that want that little bit of extra, that want to cover all their bases, and they'll go full RO. RO wastes a lot of water. That's my problem. It does, you know, yeah, especially if you're paying for water too, yeah. you know. Yeah. It, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's just... I'm in that kind of same boat myself. I've used tap water for filtered tap water through like a 
like a small boy or a, or a tall boy or something in there. It's not an RO membrane, but it's it's carbon, it's sediment. Yeah. Uh, that'll that'll take PPMs down quite a bit. I've grown organically like that, uh, just fine. I don't didn't really notice much of a decrease in value by any means um, using just a, a water filter like that. But it was good clean. Uh, water that was going through that small boy too you know it wasn't well water right <clears throat> um, no, there's not. What, what's the optimal pH so it's gonna be like plant specific obviously um, <coughs> blueberries like in less pH and then it's gonna be like um, would it, would blueberries, what do you mean, they have a higher pH? They like acidic soils, oh, okay. yeah, primarily acidic soils. What, what's that range? And that would be like a, a 5, uh, or yep, or a 5.5, yeah. 5, you know. Whereas, I'm trying to think of something that really likes basic soils. I can't really think of it off the top of my head. Potatoes. Um, yeah, potatoes. Potatoes like a high pH. They'll get low blemishes on them if they don't. What range is that? Uh, like a six and a half to seven. Okay. Yep. Um, so seven's about the highest you want to be. Correct. Now, when you say six, when you say five, when you say seven, that is a like exponential number. It's like to the tenth power or some shit. Like there is a huge number there. So to us, a five and a half or a six doesn't seem like a lot, but on this hydraulic level, it is like thousands apart from from each other oh, yeah. you know, and the meters that we have are they're good uh they're not as good as as you know they're not showing us those small minute increments um, take ph meters with a grain of salt try and always calibrate them every 30 days um you know if a ph meter says says 5.8 it could most definitely be 5.9 it could be 5.6 you know it doesn't doesn't you know, but it's somewhere around there as long as you're calibrating it. You know, don't drive yourself crazy over pH. You know, it's important to to stay in that range, maybe even a little bit on the high range when you're going through bloom. Um, and it's important to to stay saturated going through bloom uh, to not run a dry spell. Uh, that's gonna hinder everything, and especially that phosphorus that. You need. <clears throat> During your, your beginning stages of bloom, you try and get those drybacks sooner uh, to, to keep your plants from stretching too much. And then once you're through that stretch phase, you, you go full bore with that irrigation. You make sure they don't dry out. Uh, obviously, you don't want them to drown or, or hinder the roots in, in some sort of oxygen deprivation, but you want to make sure you do not dry back too much. You know, that's when you, you don't get the size and the bulk that you want. Sense. What, what about uh, how does algae affect it when you get those top layers of algae sometimes? I'm not really sure algae affects it too much. I know I that like the more I keep it wet, I start getting it. But I'm going to start covering it more because I know the light obviously is the big factor. <laughs> anywhere you put light and nutrients, it's going to grow yeah. algae anywhere. Now, I would, I would be more cautious for algae in my reservoir when I'm feeding it to the root zone than I would be if it was growing on top of my media. Really not all that worried about that. Um, what if it, you're recycling your water? Um, is, it, is that how it gets in your reservoir? That no, really too much light in your res. Oh, okay. Yep, I'm absolutely too much light. Yeah. A lot of people, like if you have your reservoir in your greenhouse or in your grow room where it's, it's susceptible to that sun yeah. or the lights, it's gonna grow. Uh, yeah. So if you can cover it or keep it out of the greenhouse, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yep, for sure. Um, nutrients breathe air, guys. Uh, that's important. Uh, roots, roots breathe air. I said nutrients. Roots breathe air. Um, plants breathe CO2. When you increase your CO2, you must increase everything else as well. If you don't get your temps up, if you don't get your your light intensity up, you're not taking advantage of the CO2 that you're delivering. Um, plants use CO2 only in the daytime. It is not important to use CO2 at night. They don't use it. Uh, in the same sense, our highest humidity levels are always hit when the lights go off. Uh, that's when humidity rises. 
So that's when CO2 shuts off. We're now able to get some more air exchange without worrying about depleting your CO2, um, especially if your DQs aren't up to size and can't keep up. Uh, you would want some inline fans to pull that humid air out of there as quick as possible. Um, that high humidity after the lights go off is, is one of the main things that hurts growers. Uh, it's the hardest part for the dehues. Um, it is the most hardest working that they have to be. Now, when you can exchange that with some inline fans or some sort of air exchange, it dramatically helps. If you get temperature swings and humidity swings over, let's say 10 to 12%, you're susceptible to almost powdery mildew every fucking time. Uh, so you, you don't want temperatures to go from 85 when the lights go off, drop down to even 70. Like you want to keep that within 10 degrees. You have to keep that within 10 degrees or you're That's asking tough. for trouble. Yep. Well, uh, what, what causes the immediate humidity rise? Your, your plants are still working. They're still oh, okay. transpiring. The yep, they're still putting water. Lights go out, heat goes out. Nothing's there to take that moisture out anymore. You know, so now yeah. your, your dehues are working overtime and they can't keep up almost every time. Can, can you reduce that if you have like the, the sunset effect in your lighting? Not a bad thing. I, I, I probably, maybe, maybe. I never even thought about that. Yeah, because I was just thinking, you know, like... Yep. Made sense kind of slow them down gradually. You yeah, know? when you have that immediate cutoff, I could see where they're just like yep. optimal. And, and I've even like, seen people, um, and you get really in depth with this, and you start messing with light spectrums. Yeah. Uh, so you can deliver them a little bit more red at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. uh, might be able to help mitigate stuff like that as well. That's interesting. You know, I, I do know a, a lot of my close friends, uh, and one of my main friends does like. The last two hours will go almost entirely red for his his flower period. Nice. And he has a the science brand of LED, uh, and the science brand of LED can can sell you and you can share and exchange different light spectrums. Oh. You, it's one of the only lights you can change the spectrum on. So uh, yeah, and you can develop your own. You can talk with tech support, and they will guide you through what you should be at, when you should be at it. And they've taken his grow to some crazy levels, man. I've really seen That's some wild. of the best. Some of the best come from his grow this this most recently. Killing it. Uh, we did all right. We did all right. I think that uh, we all have some information to go home with. When you guys are looking up information online. It's, it's very important to try and find something that says .edu instead of .com. Uh, .edu means it was university tested. It means and it's hard in the cannabis industry to find shit like that it is, but it's coming. Uh, when you can find any kind of horticulture information that is .edu, it's much, much more trusted than uh, bro science in, in .com <laughs> you know, chat rooms and shit. Right? So always look for that .edu. <clears throat> that doesn't count. Two more weeks. Two more weeks. <laughs> uh, the other guys left, uh, we thought the same thing when you're talking about a gym suit. Mm hmm. Because we both thought the same thing being in trade. We're about dry Drywall, yeah. I mean, up or the powder dust when you sand it. I would imagine it, it might have some of the same properties. I just would be cautious as to like what is added to help fire retardant and yeah, you know different house and codes and shit like that yeah it's probably not you know the main ingredient maybe gypsum but it's probably not totally gypsum you know? I also thought too that over time a little moisture you create some mold in it naturally <laughs> yeah it starts to break it down and, uh, the yeah uh, and the and same thing with like lime that increases pH that that's quite often used and it helps stabilize pH uh, lime is added to almost all the farm fields around here every fall. Um, gypsum, because we do what we do um, and we we try to build up our salt concentration in the bloom period, we try to, to build that up for about the first 20 to 30 days of that bloom period. Gypsum comes very important, especially even in organic grows, to reduce that salt content when it comes time for flushing. Um, like I said, gypsum is calcium and sulfur. It is, it is the flush master of flush masters. Like that's exactly what you want during flush. You want calcium to hold your cell walls strong to keep from buds from rotting from the inside out. Uh, and you want that sulfur. That sulfur is where a lot of our taste and smell comes from. Um, a lot of 
lettuce growers that I know too use products like silica to increase the taste uh, and even weight of their lettuce. Uh, you sell lettuce by the pound uh, and you don't make much off of it. So if you could increase the weight of your lettuce, the, the turgid uh, or, or even the cell wall thickness of your lettuce, uh, you're making more money. Um, and a lot of these guys also said that it improved the taste of their lettuce. I don't know how that relates to cannabis, but I am very curious to see what kind of silicates could be used to possibly increase the taste and smell of cannabis. If it works in lettuce, I'm not sure how that would relate, but it very well could. You know, I'm also interested in things like, like tissue culture. I'm also interested in things like um, um, plant grafting. Uh, more often done in, in woody plants than anything. You could take an apple tree and take six other apple trees and, and, and kind of clone different apple trees onto the same apple tree. Uh, and if it, it all comes from the same type of family of rootstock and the plants work well together. Uh, in the tomato industry right now, we sell um, uh, these same sort of grafted plants. Uh, we'll take a traditional greenhouse tomato and graft it on top of a rootstock of another tomato that is very, very disease, disease and pest resistant. Uh, so if you can grow tomatoes without spraying pesticides or fungicides, you're getting more money for those tomatoes. Uh, so I think that, you know, maybe even the cannabis industry in the future could, could use grafted plants um, with disease resistant rootstock. If you could imagine a, a hundred light room that you don't have to spray uh, and you know you're not going to have to spray it, uh, how much more is that worth to the grower to put that investment in? Uh, I think that 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 could come in the future. Um, grafting is very, very popular in, in, in the horticulture industry today. Yeah, buddy. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for coming and hanging out. This is more people than ever expected. Thank you guys. Sweet.